All right. Uh, welcome to. Are we on the ninth now? Uh, session of the beer brain of the firm reading group with general intellect unit. Uh, this week we are reading chapter nine, autonomic management. Um, and uh, beer's intro to this chapter is. I actually, there we go. Uh, so, um, the body has understood uh, this dilemma about autonomy for several hundred thousand years, and we can learn from it. Its solution is called the autonomous nervous system, appropriately enough. By the end of chapter nine, we shall see, we shall have seen how it works, uh, and we shall also have worked out uh, gotta love that. What is it? Past perfect uh, <laughs> verb form there. Uh, <laughs> oh no, now I'm gonna get, this is recorded. Now I'm gonna get in trouble with the grammar police. They're gonna revoke my English teacher license. Uh, tricks on, or jokes on them. I never got one. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and we shall also have worked out its relevance to the management task. Three vital systems are identified as prerequisites of all autonomous control. Uh, so yeah, this is really a bridging chapter between chapter eight and chapter 10. Um, it's, it's really just like, hey, here's all that physiology stuff we talked about in the earlier part of this section. Uh, let's start to build the VSM out of it. Um, let's start to think about organization. Uh, so what are uh, general thoughts on this chapter? Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, it's um, like after, what, a hundred and something pages, it, it finally all starts to come together. <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. Um, it's a great chapter. I um, uh, Yeah, so a lot of it's just retreading the physiology stuff in management terms. It's, it's all quite good. But um one of the things that really jumped out at me this time um, was that we get we get some clarity on like the actual definition of System One, and I, I'm starting to think that I might have actually must misunderstood what System One elements really were all along. Um, that elements are the control elements of the subunits; they're not the subunits themselves, um, which I think is actually really, really important. So when we get to that that part on page 126, we'll kind of pause and go over that stuff. Uh, that's that's yeah. really crucial. Like I, I, I think that, that clarified my understanding of it. It's like oh, they're not actually sub bodies; they're the control elements of the. I had the same thought reading this chapter. I was mm -hmm. like, "Oh wait, what's this?" <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's that interface control element. Um, yeah, uh, go ahead. No, oh, any anything else to say? Okay, that's the main thing. Yeah, uh, I'd say that was the most surprising thing about this chapter for me. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, um, yeah, like from what I took out of the VSM guide, uh, this was a rather different understanding. Um, now I don't know if that's kind of the last word on system one, uh, but it is certainly worth bearing in mind, uh, that this is the organization that beer has laid out here. Um, I, any other thoughts on chapter nine? Uh, Rudy, go ahead. Kind of following what Shane is saying, I'm also in doubt about the system one thing because I remember at some point I had this idea that the system ones were also viable systems in itself and there was some sort of recursion. While like Shane was saying earlier, the systems ones are not the control of a system. So I'm not sure how that meshes together. Yes, uh, if in fact the uh, working body itself is external uh, to System 1, that implies that it does not recur. Uh, so, a uh, recursive. So, uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, th th this stuff is so tricky because and this is probably the root of some of my kind of ongoing confusion. Um, uh, Yes, the, the the things are meant to be recursive, right? But like, well, no. So, like in in this chapter, it's the subsidiaries that are su sub VSMs, 
but the system one element that's actually called out is the control interface of subsidiary, not the entire subsidiary itself, which I think is kind of important because um, I think when we're, think when we're thinking about the recursive like um, model, I think we can sometimes think of it as like containment, like the like like uh, Russian dolls, whatever. That one, one thing is fully contained within within the other, which which implies like a full subsumption, which I think is actually not what we is really going for. He's going for that the the control elements are recursively nested in a containment fashion, but the actual activities themselves may not be. I think there's a there's a Beer actually does draw a very clear distinction between activity and control and the control of the activity. Like he, he draws a distinction between the subsidiary and the control element of the subsidiary. And it's, I think it, we can often get kind of slipped up into which one we're kind of thinking about. So, um, I think this gets the, the most messy at the level where you're kind of like at the bottom level at like the, where the, there's like a direct human interface. Cause like a kind of, if somebody was to take the VSM model and fit it easily onto like an org chart kind of organization, they would see, say that like, oh, people are viable systems. Therefore, like a team is a, is a viable system composed of people and the people are the system one elements. And that's, that's our way of looking at it, right? Like you're coordinating the activities of the people. But elsewhere, Beer talks about things that really suggest otherwise that like he, he talks, I think in the previous chapter where it's like, um, you know, you could, or it might, it's maybe even the beginning of this chapter where it's like, oh, you could have a company of one person and that one person is wearing the five hats of the thing. And then if you had two people, you'd have five functions divided between two. So there's very clearly a slippage between the identifiable bodies and the actual tasks being controlled. I think that's, that's the most obvious when you're at the kind of human interface level, because it's really kind of clear of like, Hey, what, what are we actually controlling here? Are we controlling people or are we controlling pr processes? And the, the kind of weird reality is you're actually kind of doing both. But I, I, I tend to lean away from, I think, the trap of identifying like the particular like tactile objects as being the system one elements and, and think more about system one elements being kind of processes and, um, and, and activities. Um, but to be fair, like, and this is why I've, I found it so confusing all along is that Beer kind of does equivocate on this. He's, he's not especially clear. Um, and I think he, he kind of plays both sides of the card in some places. Yeah. And I, I'm a little bit skeptical of that reading, uh, that like perhaps the individuals are, um, in so far as they connect with the viable system under consideration are mm -hmm. uh actually like kind of just a mapping of functions onto people right mm -hmm. like that it does the, that the the interface system is not really the person it's more the person as seen by the VSM Right. The, yeah, the functions yeah. that are inherent to that person insofar as they connect to the broader system. Um, mm -hmm. Because Beer, when he talks in this chapter and in previous chapters about um, viable systems, he has he puts a very strong emphasis on integrity and unity. Right. Yeah, so yeah. if an individual is a viable system, they that viable system must be integral to them and it must also be a unitary system. Um, otherwise, mm -hmm. it's not a viable system because, you know, the beer is really at pains to stress that. So um, mm -hmm. this is an interesting point, right? Like it's like like I don't think we get so much. Um, the idea that, well, there's the sense in which for the individual, they are viable. And there's the sense for which the system has like a separate viable system that it projects onto them. Because I think that would be overriding mm -hmm. their autonomy in a sense, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we've I got, a, sure. we've got a lot of, uh, uh, comments here. Uh, so, uh, we'll go to, uh, Steve and then to Rudy. And then to Jeremy. Yeah, not um, maybe not too much. I mean, I, I absolutely did start to start question myself too in terms of like, are these 
or the different systems in this people or the organizations and, and the lines of that started to like blur and almost become less clear as I was reading through this. Um, but it also like, you know, I'm relatively new to this stuff too, but starting to read more of like the discussions in the chats um, over the last couple of weeks as I've gotten more into this and really seeing how people like identify different sorts of behavior with the different systems and how, you know, there's all these questions of like, you know, is this system three or what, what, what system would this particular you know organization be? And I mean, I'm starting to see that from the book. Uh, I'm just a little curious, like, is that something that's like continuing, will continue to be like elucidated through? Is that something that like, oh, I should have a good sense of what each system does at this point. And I mean, it's sort of related to the fact that like, are these systems sort of clear entities as people, as organizations. And um, so the question is just sort of like I'm starting to, the, the confusion here is starting to actually grow a little bit <laughs> right? As I, as I try to make sense of all of this. Yeah, and I think that's, that's an experience all of us are going through a little bit here. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that I'm any clearer on this than most people here. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, uh, I think that is partially inherent to the nature of this chapter as a bridging chapter between physiology and organization, uh, uh, organizational management, right? Uh, so there is a kind of like weird liminal space happening here. And it's, um, I think it, that is producing confusion because this is where the boundary is, right? Um, there's like a hybridity here. Um, and so I believe like in terms of like identifying in an organization, like, oh, this should be system three. This is the function of performance. We've seen the roots of that in the previous chapter, but it's going to be more clearly articulated going forward as we talk about uh, specific organizational theory. Um, like as I think, you know, I haven't read further in this book. I mean, I know Jeremy and Shane, you have. Uh, but my feeling is like, you know, at the start of the book, Beer said that the third section is where you get the conversation you actually came to this book for. And I think that's probably where we're going to see that stuff that you're talking about. Um, yeah, Lauren is screaming uh, as a uh, technical editor uh, over this uh, writing approach. Uh, <laughs> in a sense, I, I, this reminds me a lot of like the dialectical writing style that you get in Europe, uh, like essay structure, which is the absolute like inverse of the five paragraph essay, uh, uh, where it's like you have the thesis front loaded. Um, so yeah, this is, this is, uh, contrary to everything our Anglo hearts, uh, hold dear, uh, in terms of theory and, and, uh, and, and writing. Okay. Uh, Rudy and then Jeremy. Yeah, I was thinking also like along these topics, because if you not so much the body example, but take uh, the cyber sin example there, what was the system one? Because we had this discussion a few weeks ago. Is it the company is a system one and then the company itself is a system, a viable system on itself? But I, like you're saying, I found that somewhat lacking because it's not autonomous enough. Well, this solution that the system one is the way you're interfacing with this factory is probably a much better one because then take the factory as a BSM. What is the lower system one? At some point it's a worker, but the worker's life is not limited to the company. While the body example, like your heart doesn't exist outside your body, but in a company, people have to exist outside the company. So. Um, and I would just kind of question that, like your heart could exist outside your body. You could hook it up to a machine and run it, right? Like it, it it's, it's it's not uh, absolutely integral to your body uh, and inseparable. I mean, organ transplants are a thing, right? Um, uh, okay, uh, Jeremy, go ahead. So Rudy kind of hit at something I was going to say, but I can elaborate, which is, you know, under capitalism, most labor is alienated labor which means that 
the worker as a human being, as its own viable system, as their own viable system, you know, when you're at work under an alienated role, you're thinking about football, you're thinking about your kids, you know, you're not, you're thinking the bare minimum you need to do to crank that lathe or do whatever shite you're supposed to do. And so that can't be part of the company. Your dreams and the rest of your, what Lefebvre would call everyday life, is not part of the DSM of your company. So really, the part any particular worker plays is how their roles are mapped onto the VSM, and therefore the system one part that includes a particular worker who has no metasystemic duties is really how the company interfaces with that particular worker. Um, okay, right. So it, it is the interface and not an exhaustive account of the individual, which can kind of view, be viewed holographically uh as its own uh recursive vsm it's it's actually so essentially this is not a uh part whole discussion it's a serial discussion this is uh like um i guess it's it's kind of more like function application right rather than saying like oh this is like a nested set I don't know. No, that's not logical. But um, I'm trying to get at something here where, like, these are essentially chained and recursive on their own rather than being uh, a, like, uh, you know, uh, holistic uh, account that is encompassing. Um, uh, okay, Shane, go ahead. Yes, I, I think... Um uh, I, I think the we might actually have a kind of a problem here where I think beer is like taking the, the biological sort of nervous system model and then kind of like scaling it up into the, the social sort of level, which is which does work. But I think we, we could maybe take some of like Deleuze and Guattari's kind of read of their their kind of metaphysics of like the stratum and the, the way that like the same kind of dynamics play out, but in very different, like more explosive kind of ways as you go up the levels of extra abstraction. So you get the same dynamics in like the, the physical layer, you get the same dynamics again, but more weird and deterritorialized in the organic layer. And then you get to the alloplastic layer, which is like the cultural social layer and the same dynamics again, but even weirder. And like the, the relations become more, um, more uh kind of dislocated in space and time they become less about containment so like um an org an organ of the body strictly contains one of its like molecules like it's it's, it's atoms or whatever is strictly contained inside of it then you go up to the organic layer and it's like well the organ can be displaced out of the body and then you go up to the alloplastic layer and it's well all this can be displaced fucking everywhere and so containment and like locality become less and less of a thing the further up the stack of abstraction you go I think so. I think Beer is right that the, the the same dynamics are present higher up in the in these kind of abstraction layers, but there's a kind of there's a difference in kind that comes with um, this kind of like transition from the organic to the socioplastic kind of um, kind of layers, which makes things like I mean like so like a person is a viable system, but then they participate in many viable systems. Like your your heart will only participate in one body at a time. But I, as a person, participate in my family, in my company, a such and such friend group or whatever. And I think an assemblage theory is probably the more appropriate kind of model as you go further and further up. Like things get weirder and more ghostly. And the further down you go, the more the more concrete they get. Does that make any sense? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's true until you get to the quantum level and then they get weirder again. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, I think that is probably a good theory. I'm not 100% sure it accords with what Beer is saying because he's kind of saying in this chapter, yes, that's true, that happens, but ideally these should be these should be unitary and integral. Mm -hmm. They should not yeah. be 
uh, uh, they should not be uh, weird assemblages that just kind of partially interface mm-hmm. with each other in chaotic ways. Um, there is, yeah. I, I, I think there's a kind of opposite impulse in beer because he's interested in organization. Like he wants to organize. Um, so I think he's kind of like, if I had to take a general thought at how beer approaches that question, it seems to me like he's saying, yes, uh, you know, things become uh, less predictable. They become more complex um, as you go uh, to, to higher levels. But we need organizational systems that will attenuate variety at those levels and organize them, not uh, sort of operate in that that like, you know, rhizomatic floaty way. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Totally. Yeah. So uh but I, you know, I think they're 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 like two different angles of looking at the same question, um, and and maybe the Deleuze and Guattari one is a better way of looking at it. I don't know, but I think it's going to be an interesting question. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I'm 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 finding it um, uh, helpful to think to uh, think of in terms of like you know the, the, the VSM is the is, is the nervous system like it's it's not the whole body. And, uh, uh, you know, like, even though different layers kind of speak different languages, it does actually kind of speak like a common language, you know, or, or, or like the Internet, you know, in, in, a, in a way that um, uh, uh, like the rest of it uh, uh, kind of doesn't. Uh, and so, you know, lo- lo- like you know, your, your, your liver is like its own thing, you know, it has its, it's, its own mode of production. Like, uh, uh, and, well, you know, neurons, even if they have different, um, uh, you know, e- e- even if you know they've got different shapes, you know, like are kind of speaking a common language. And so, like, uh, you know, like where the system one meets like a subsystem, like that's like a n- neuromuscular junction because you know like, your muscles handle all kinds of crap uh, on their own. Um, uh, uh, and so, yeah, you know, well, uh, like that's a. Uh, um, yeah, or, or you know, like uh, um, uh, the my understanding of how like um, uh, you know, commissioned officers like work, in that a lot of what they are actually doing isn't is is more about just like coordinating with like other you know sections, and like you know they're learning how to you know relay map um uh, uh, directions to people, and and, uh, and and you know they know how to talk to the artillery battalion, and like you know they they know how to uh, uh you know communicate with. How you know you you deal with like uh, air forces like it, it's a lot about intersystem stuff versus like other stuff that's you know kind of a you know speaking its own internal language or you know like an internet protocol. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. That's that's a that's another good thought. Like you know how uh, how far does this go down? Uh, are there different kinds of things that would not be uh, considered viable, um, but nonetheless are are living um, because of their connection to a viable system. Um, Okay, I think we've had like enough general discussion. Um, let's let's move on to uh, like talking about the chapter some more. Um, okay, so um, Beer is saying at the beginning um, we are talking about the control of a that is to say any uh, viable organism. Uh, thus, the firm may be small or large. If the firm is small, and suppose that in the limiting case it consists of a one-man band, then all the functions we have been discussing will be condensed precisely into the one man. It was mentioned before that there is a mathematical account of the model building process, uh, but from the mathematical point of view, by far the most elegant and satisfying model of anything at all is in fact itself. Uh, So it's like, yeah, there's a... I don't know, algebraic model. I don't know what, I don't know what the mathematical model is, but there is a model out there somewhere. Uh, But, you know, actually, uh, it's kind of better to talk about the thing itself rather than to talk about the mathematics because uh, that's just, that's just better. It's not a facsimile. Um, uh that must sound odd to anyone who hopes to use a model for purposes of elucidation, but it does at least provide a valid and su- substantial starting point. If a man is the firm, then he is using his own nervous system to run the firm. If two men go into partnership, then they are likely to divide the functions of the firm between them. Suppose that one of them makes things while the other goes out to sell them. We can see the sense in which the first man has all the interoceptors, 
I don't think this term has come up before, but I think it's just like, you know, internal checking receptors, right? Um, he is the one who knows about the state of the machinery he is using. The rooms he's working in, the heat, the light, the raw materials, work in progress, and available finished goods. The other man has the exteroceptors. He provides the interface with suppliers and markets and brings back information about the interaction of the firm with the world outside. How do we now see the ascending hierarchy of computing systems which can constitute the brain of the firm? Um, so as you're kind of saying that, it's, it's not... It's not the uh, entirety of the thing. It is the brain of the thing, which is actually the nervous system and the brain together is the brain of the firm. Um, undoubtedly, these two men will talk together. And if the partnership is a good one, they will mutually decide on the filtrations, on the control actions at every level and ultimately on the firm's policy. If the firm is now enlarged to a sizable business in which several hundred people are taking part, the position is not so simple. We shall in any orthodox business discover that the whole organization has become fragmented. Among the work people, this is unexceptionable. We have the analog of the body's organs, each performing its appointed task. But control is vested in management, and the likelihood is that management has become fragmented too. Instead of the mainstream of ascending information passing through a hierarchy of computing systems, we shall find information going up, as it were, in species of information that relating to production, to cost, to sales, and so on. And the heads of each of these functional divisions, each of whom is probably a director of the firm, now have the task of communicating, of shouting to each other across the void. This task they will find rather difficult, because once the firm grows to any size, the intimacy of what used to be a partnership is lost. The people simply do not have sufficient time to do as much talking as information theory would calculate they need to do if complete harmony is to be established. After all, if you want to know in complete detail what I have been doing for the last hour, then I shall want exactly one further hour to explain. If I have ten colleagues and cannot see on average more than two of them at once, then I shall need five hours to explain my one hour. It is just an application of the law of requisite variety. If I can afford no more than 10 minutes in explaining myself for every hour worked, then I shall devote two minutes per pair of colleagues, and there will be a ratio of 30 to 1 in the reduction of variety between myself and them. Some lethargic managerial societies seem to work quite smoothly on this basis. For the very simple reason that for them, this turns out to also to be also the ratio of clock time to wor useful working activity. <laughs> so <laughs> they do 30 units of bullshitting for every one unit of useful working time. <laughs> um, but a man who really is doing an hour's work in every hour is bound to lose an intelligibility. Next, we must note that this applies in the best of all worlds, one in which people love each other and are completely determined to share their understanding. But human nature is not like this. Even the most willing of us finds himself antipathetic in varying degrees to some of his uh, colleagues. Even the most innocent of us occasionally succumbs to political motives which make him a deliberately poor communicator. The conservatively minded businessmen among us will have none of this somewhat ruthless analysis. There is no need for goodness sake to tell me or for me to tell everyone else in detail what I'm doing. I am paid to do my job properly and all that anyone else needs to know is what I think they ought to know about the results of my work. And yet this is just the trouble. A viable organism works as an integral whole. A typical business is integrated too late and too little. Anyone of experience and perception who analyzes last week's business experience in his own firm is going to appreciate the point. People have ordered supplies that were there all the time or that are no longer needed. People have taken a particular direction in a given matter because of a circumstance which is much outweighed by another circumstance of which they were unfortunately ignorant. If we could stop the business this week to analyze what happened last week, we should all be sadder but wiser. 
Okay, so what are what are thoughts on on this section? We've covered uh, a good deal of this in the earlier discussion, uh, but uh, this is the first the the details. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, I think that this this the, the, he's setting up the problem here of like fragmentation, right? That like it's the the fragmented activities and the uh, I think he says a little bit later that you'll get like a management consultant or whoever who's like tasked with reintegrating the stuff, but then by then it's too late. Like you need you need the system to actually interleave all these processes as it goes. It's not enough to try to stitch the shards back together again later. I kind of wanted to go to like just to, to remark on, on almost the very start of that that like. Suppose that one of them makes things while the other goes out and sells them. I think this is kind of Beer's kind of 60s sort of industrial sort of mindset where there's one job for one person, uh, one activity for one person. Like there's a strict identity between the human beings and the one and only one activity that they form. Um, and that's the thing that I, I think I find question with because like we see in like say the VSM guide, there's the an example of the, the small co-op where you've got what three people and five, jo five jobs. And it, like it, it, it's very obvious that there's actually kind of slippage across what the the activities that are being coordinated actually are. Um, I kind of feel, I, I feel that maybe because the, the the ground assumptions here of like oh of course if there's two people and there's sales and making then one of them is going to do one of each and he kind of writes off the possibility that both would do both you know that like you would, you would spend half your day making stuff and half of it selling it and or flip around all the time. Um, so that's it's just really interesting that that's there as an assumption at the start. Yeah, um, it is definitely a result of the process of like increasing the division of labor um, that happens after Taylor, right? Um, and kind of gets clawed back uh, starting in the, I guess, 80s. Um, uh, probably this speaks to more than anything Beer's audience of managers who are used to this stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. Um, uh, now, uh, we're going to go to Jake and then Lauren. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think this is, this is definitely an interesting chapter and it, it does feel like it's starting to come together, um, slowly, but you know, still it feels like there's something being built. Uh, definitely. Um, and yeah, like from the stuff, like the first, couple pages are kind of it seems like going over the problem of like how yeah how that information of like what is happening is communicated and um i don't know if he exactly goes into it in the rest of the chapter like some specifics or if that's what we have to wait for the part three of the book to get into but it's just uh definitely something that i've been thinking a lot about like what are those like automatic processes that send data to the rest of the the systems or i mean like from system one to system two and to system three all that stuff um because like obviously with a body the answer is very easy easy it's in that it's just automatic and it's like part of the function of how it's like constructed which i guess i guess that's kind of the point of the whole like model right that it's like an automatic like as part of how it's constructed it provides feedback to the rest of the model only i don't know how to do that what that would look like i mean i guess computers play a role in it and that's kind of like a novel thing from writing from the 60s or 70s uh whereas now it kind of feels like well yeah of course there's like metadata associated with everything and everything has like some like information that's sending to all the different parts of you know, your your uh, your smart fridge is sending uh, data to the rest of the the house. You know, like all these things, but like to integrate it in like a more organized and like useful way is is interesting, and I'm I'm curious to see like what that looked like in some practice or how and how we can like replicate it in some way. Yeah, I, I think we can probably say that uh, the smart home is is not a viable system because your your provider can just flip a little switch and boop the whole thing dies um uh pay me a subscription fee every month now uh in order to have your lights turn on 
Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, no, that's fair. And I like you know, the, obviously, beer puts a lot of stock in the value of the microcomputer in achieving this. Uh, but it's also worth noting that like any example that we do get in this book um, of how this ought to work is necessarily going to be outdated. So we can get stuff that's maybe a little bit more parsable uh, than it's, oh, it's just the body. But like, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's not going to give us the instruction manual on how to do this today because the tech is just so different. Uh, the circumstances are too, uh, as Shane was sort of pointing to. Uh, okay, Lauren, go ahead. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because <laughs> um, what this, section brought to mind was like uh organizations that kind of start with one or two people or start and don't have like a purpose or don't have like haven't like had that conversation about what are we doing where are we going and like getting that shit done up front um because it's interesting that like identity is mentioned because like, i found that when there is this fragmentation of like jobs that inevitably like get put upon people if there's not that conversation up front um, you tend to get organizations that fit into sort of privilege hierarchies <laughs> where uh, it's it'll be, yeah, like the ones is white dude at the top and then who has stuff that needs done and then, you know, uh, women end up taking on all that burden or people, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I really, I felt this like a sort of identity politics level <laughs> where um, systems can work, but often it's at that cost of like sort of identity politics to get rubbed into it if it's not purpose and intent behind what you're doing yeah like beer appeals to human nature here uh but you certainly could find like a mediating layer of problems uh that is actually uh structural um so you know he says like a requirement for a truly viable organization is first of all uh that people love each other which is Something that, you know, you probably don't find in most management textbooks because it's considered to be out of the question. Uh, but uh, that's important um, and are completely determined to share their understanding. Uh, so, you know, if, if you wanted to have the sort of ideal organization, that would be um, the, the sort of limit case. Uh, obviously he's not going to demand that everyone loves each other and have, have, have a complete commitment to sharing, but you can certainly see how like structural inequalities are going to, uh, throw wrenches in this, in this, uh, sort of, uh, ideal case, um, where information will be withheld on the basis of sort of the old boys club or, uh, you know, where, um, yeah. For other various reasons, like, oh, like, oh, you you couldn't possibly understand this because this information is gendered or, uh, you know, like uh, your sort of people aren't smart enough to understand this. Or I don't I don't I don't want you getting in on this because we got to maintain a race hierarchy in this organization. Uh, like, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Or like even, um, you know, having uh, family barbecues but excluding queer couples um, from that and and those barbecues being core sort of networking things like the ones that beer was talking about with tea time in the in the uh, the previous chapter uh, There's all kinds of ways you can think about this happening. Um, so it's a very important point for sure. Um, OK, so uh, let's let's move on then. Um, so there is the whole example that beer gives here of his personal experience uh, uh, dealing with, uh, these problems. Um, it's pretty, uh, entertaining. Um, uh, <laughs> the ultimate solution is piling off cuts in the boot of a car. Uh, <laughs> after a lot of sort of like mutual vetoing between the two departments, the manager's like, just, just throw it all in the boot. Send it out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so not, uh, especially good handling of it. Eventually the kind of like, uh, managerial veto function does kick in, but it's, it's not an elegant solution. Um, 
All right. So uh, then he talks about um, this other thing, which I think is actually quite important uh, from the viewpoint of socialism. Uh, so he says, there's a huge number of examples of breakdown in the control system of the firm from these causes, most of which are far less risable and far more serious. Um, indeed, the most serious examples are perhaps the most common, and they have to do with the firm's major policy. Capital investment in plant is going to be decided by production people who think they know what the market requirements are. This is because the marketing people keep telling the production people what they want. But the marketing people do this on the basis that they know what the production facilities are. And so quite typically, there is a chicken and egg problem, which only the managing director or the board itself can solve. Unfortunately, these people are likely to see the problem, uh, which only the managing director or the board itself can solve. Unfortunately, uh, Sorry, uh, unfortunately, these people are likely to see the problem as a battle of influence between the two protagonists, and they may well fail to notice that an integral solution, one which looks to the viability of the firm as a whole, will give a completely different answer. So, yeah, again, you may think, oh, yeah, like the board of directors is going to figure this out. The CEO is going to give a direction, right? Like Beer was saying, like, uh, you know, gesture in one direction or gesture in the other. Uh but unfortunately, what the uh, CEO sees this as is a political issue, right? This, this, this is, first of all, interpreted as these uh, directors expressing their political interests because the meta language that the CEO understands is that of uh, interdepartmental rivalry. Um, and therefore, it's not actually a integral uh solution uh shane go ahead yeah <clears throat> yeah this this stuff's really this, this is really interesting and yeah it's like um it immediately brings to mind the kind of bolsh model right or whatever of these uh these kind of uh centralized kind of things and it, it's it's very interesting here because like his, his whole um framing is very much this like uh integral sort of information processing like the whole the whole organization needs to act as an information processor as, as a as an integral system it has to compute these results but when control functions are over identified with particular persons the person actually acts as a block to information processing because their subjective position is so narrow and this is a really tricky thing that like human subjects often have a much narrower like ability to this information than like, I mean, even, even a little bit later, he's like, you know, the, the, the three pound computer in your head is actually pretty damn limited. And so decision making really has to not reside within particular people. It has to be a distributed function in order for the overall group organism to compute the result correctly. If information gets stuck inside the skulls of people, the whole the whole flow will come to a halt. Yeah, indeed. Um, and, uh, you know, for. The question of socialism, I find this to be important because it gets to uh, even in a socialist society, you would see these kinds of um, informational problems happening between, uh, say, the consumer sector and the sector producing means of production or uh, in between, uh, say, like, uh, you know, citizens groups and workers groups, um, like all, all this kind of uh, informational asymmetry resulting in, um, well, not just asymmetry, but just like attenuation resulting in political conflict um, uh, is, is something that we could anticipate happening. Uh, cause we, like, we've seen it happen in socialist societies already. We know this happens. It's just a fact. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the people who insist that this will not happen in true communism are just like what this is out to lunch. Um, I've read essays to that effect, uh, when I was reading about the sort of debates about socialism and market socialism and stuff. Uh, and it's just not informed by, any kind of reasonable information. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's go on then. Um, so uh, 
In real life, the position is much complicated by the viewpoints of other directors. For instance, the financial director may be wholly obsessed with an orthodox professional analysis of the situation. If so, he will be taking a language that has to do with replacement costs and investment allowances. A language which may be conducive to the inevitable, inevitable perpetuation of the existing state of affairs. He may be supported by an engineering director thinking in precisely the same terms. The firm that is most likely to break out of these endless loops is one in which the managing director has provided himself with a first-rate operational research group. If these people are left to acquaint themselves with the nature of the business and to make integral analyses of the firm's viability, they may well succeed in providing the linkage between the separate fragments which is required. Unfortunately, domestic OR groups are typically encumbered with problems fed to them by the fragments. That suits them because it justifies their existence in the eyes of the individual board members. But if a production manager commissions an operational research study of what he takes to be a production problem, he quite certainly expects a production-oriented solution. He does not want the OR group to start talking to him about sales policy and so on. On the other hand, whoever has an, to answer to the board for the cost of the OR department is not at all happy that they should be working away on what appears to be nothing in particular, and therefore he encourages the group to devote itself to assignments allocated by the sectional heads. So uh, it's like, at, in the first place, the departmental heads are going to be encumbered by their uh, habitus um, and their their way of viewing the world, uh, you know. So this is perhaps uh, this perhaps speaks to one of the uh, main problems uh, with central bank autonomy under neoliberalism. Uh, if you want to use the central bank as the control system for the entire society you unfortunately are only going to get a central banker's perspective on what that society ought to look like. Um, now, uh, one way to get out of this is to, to create a general OR group. But as, as Beer says here, uh, the OR group is going to need to justify its, uh, its existence to the managing directors, uh, and therefore it's going to produce uh, incoherent overall uh products right like because it's going to be oh here is the the or view of production here is the or view of sales and these things do not actually cohere with each other and in fact the even the executive is going to encourage this because he's going to say well i don't just want you like going around and and looking at everything like that's just a mess like don't do that um, so it's, it's, a it's a, it's a serious muddle, uh, that we're in here. Uh, any sort of things to talk about? Like, I think Lauren, you were saying that, like, this is very relatable, uh, from the perspective of like, uh, government departments dealing with finance or dealing with treasury. Yeah. Do you want to speak to that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I, yeah, I, uh, gosh, um, yeah, I was thinking about trying to get policy through at a national government level, and it's like one department will put the policy forward, the minister will present it to cabinet. Um, but on the policy level, you're always battling with treasury, who are like, well, this isn't like this isn't a good use of money. <laughs> uh, like we thought about this and this and this, like this risk analysis, and we're of course we're like, oh, we hate them. Like they they always like ruin our fun and make us like have to answer the problem, like have to answer to the budget and stuff, and um, or. Worst case scenario, your policy is in joint with other departments, and then you have to get them to buy in. So if you need justice or like conservation or someone else to get on board, and you're just, you're talking different languages, you have different agendas, you have different places you're coming from to get this like one piece, like national piece of policy through, um, and it, it's a shit show. <laughs> so I wasn't surprised to see a reference to like the prime minister of the UK in this book. Cause, cause oh yeah, we get <laughs> we we get that dig at Thatcher. Uh, that comes up, uh, which is, I assume, from the second edition of the book. Um, okay, Matt and then uh, Jake. Yeah, well, what he's talking about with the OR group just reminds me very much of, you know, what, what often happens with uh, um, 
uh, 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 data science departments now. You know, companies are like creating them, um, uh, uh, you know, partially out of like just buzz and hype. And you know, it really is a matter of like you, uh, there's like a court tier game of like you know, w w w uh, you, you, your your job is basically to make some manager look good. And if you know, like, there's really just one department that you know um, uh, is interested in doing that, then you know, you have to do things that 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 are just about that department, even uh, uh, um, you know, um, unless um you know, like like uh, really top executives like have enough of an attention span to like really um, integrate, you know, like the data science stuff, you know, like it, 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 it is a thing where, you know, uh, what you're doing isn't necessarily that useful for like the whole. Right. Uh, you just become a, a partial advisor. There's an example that comes up later in this chapter where uh, an OR group optimizes a department so much that it actually takes over the organization. Um, because it's operating so much more efficiently than everybody else. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, Jake, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think this kind of, like, is, it's an interesting, like, example, I guess, of how, like, sort of this capitalist notion of, like, well, we have to, the hierarchy is natural and good and don't disrupt the hierarchy as, like, beer or any, like, systems thinking person coming into a firm and saying, like, well, no, why don't you try examining it from this angle and the manager, the people in charge, CEO, or whatever, being like, whoa, whoa, we don't want to disrupt how things are working. Like things were working well, you know, like we couldn't have them working any differently because that would be bad. And just like even, you know, you can counter that in like, I mean, you can counter that in like leftist circles too of like people who the more, I guess, authoritarian minded, whatever that, you know, buzzword, but like the people that are like, well, you know, oh, don't, don't like, send don't ask like general membership this question or don't ask general membership to do this like you have to go through this person who is in charge of doing this thing and then by the time you're able to go through that person like the whole it's no longer like as relevant or as useful and just like an interesting way of just this concept of of organizing things differently is like very threatening to people who like mean like you were saying Lauren, like generally like old white men who are have this power already and are worried about any shift in their power uh due to like a more equitable way of organizing things or a more democratic way of distributing the information as like a affront to their power which in a sense it kind of is but their power should be affronted so you know uh learn go ahead uh yeah i um it's funny to me when we were talking about sort of principles of love and caring for each other and that being kind of like the foundation of any organization. Because I can see if you're in breach of that principle, this goes really wrong. It's like I, I've worked in organizations where senior managers hated each other. <laughs> like there were a lot of decisions made out of spite because it's like, well, I don't want him to like, win on this one. So I'm going to do this, even though it wasn't in the interest of the company or the people working there or anything. It was like, I'm going to win this, this battle. <laughs> um, and how that can be really toxic for it. And sort of, poison the rest of the organism the organism yes uh definitely well and the whole thing like you're saying matt about like the courtier problem uh it you know it's 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 it gets back to what i was saying in the, the previous discussion about how like yeah if you have a unitary authoritarian system this problem just manifests itself as court politics um and yeah it's it's not a solution to have a sun king running everything. Um, okay, so uh, we'll go on then. Um, so he says it's absurd to lay the whole onus for the integration of a business upon the OR group. Um, good to know. <laughs> um, so this needs to be done by an anatomy and a physiology designed to this very end. We saw in chapter one how it comes about that businesses do not actually have uh, well-designed control systems. And hitherto, no one could blame them for it. Uh, we did not have the information handling capability to do other than what we have traditionally done. But today, we have that capability thanks to electronics. Um, so, uh, you know, he says microcomputers are going to revolutionize this. Um you know, in some ways, they have. Uh, there certainly are incredible uh, computing systems for integration that we see in, like, Amazon or Walmart or whatever. Like, they are really amazing. Uh, they haven't really um, addressed 
more fundamental problems, but like certainly beer was pointing in the right direction when he pointed this out. Uh, like that thing about like, you know, um, what is it? Uh, buying stock that is already in the warehouse or, uh, selling something that you don't have because the, 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 the synchronization is out of whack. Um, like that kind of stuff has actually been addressed by, uh, electronic inventory systems. Um, so, you know, he's pointing in the right direction. It's just, there's a lot of other issues that uh, people didn't take his advice on. Um, so yeah, we have interconnections. Um, as long as computers are regarded as quote unquote sophisticated and more particularly, as long as they are typically used to do the wrong job, they are an extravagance. Uh, it is a matter of priorities. It might well be better to spend what in existing circumstances sounds like an appallingly large sum on a correct application of computers than to do anything else. Uh, so again, that like, or sorry, this, this I think speaks to the whole idea of the, the, the Soviet internet, uh, that, that was, uh, proposed in the USSR, uh, that we saw covered in, in Red Plenty, right? Like it is, uh, a, appallingly large sum on a correct application of computers. Um, and it was not undertaken because it was an appallingly large sum. It was more than developing atomic weapons. Um, but maybe it could have saved the organization in some way. Maybe. Uh, uh, but it does have to be a correct application. And by that rather silly adjective, readers will now more readily understand is meant an application which provides integral control. At present, a firm must tackle this task virtually from fr first principles and from within. This is because neither the computer manufacturers nor the consultants who avide, advise on computer applications have made any effort to design a systematic package for controlling the firm. So, Jeremy, this, this gets to what you were saying previously, like, make software out of this. You can do it. <laughs> it's useful. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, they seem to think that every company is different, and so it is, but not in every way. Uh, I consider that it would be possible to produce a quintuple, quintuple hierarchy system of mixed analog and digital hardware uh, together with a mixed command and tracking language software, which would give any firm a flying start in tailor making as it inevitably must its own control system. The possibilities have been open for many years. And once again, we must consider the introduction of microprocessors, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay. And there's the pr problem of mon monopolistic control over computers, which he says that uh, microprocessors are going to upend as they indeed did, but this did not produce VSM software. Uh, Matt and then Jeremy. Um, uh, uh, what, what, yeah, uh, 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 talking about the, the difference between, uh, you know, how computer systems were used in the U.S. Uh, versus the USSR, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about how um, you probably do, like, an interesting VSM analysis of, like, ARPA itself, because, like, I feel like it's not an accident that, you know, like, um, the U.S., which had, like, a kind of unique institution, but, like, ARPA was created by Fiat, by Eisenhower, specifically to, like, rise above, like, the fray of, like, different, um, uh, you know, of the Department of the Navy having its own research that they're very, you know, uh, that they're very protective of and like it really is kind of brilliant and like you know it, it's 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 institutional dynamics seem like yeah any of that, that that are very cool and unique and i yeah i think that's why like we got that correct application of of uh, of computers in the in our uh, arpanet and uh also j j j just thinking about like the flying starts um uh, um like it, it's it's interesting how like um you know th there are like some companies that like make like you know like the software for like every like like every gym has like the same like software suite and it's terrible software but like e even even terrible software like uh, uh you know is like it, it, what it gives you is still just so invaluable that like any gym or like pretty much any restaurant you know like, like point of sale like, stuff uh, you cut out there Matt I am uh, uh yeah the, uh, like any gym or, or like or like any restaurant um, uh, um, uh, what's it's, uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, like, like you need this, like, like, like even, even a really terrible version of this software just makes you so much more efficient that, you know, any excellent one has to have. Uh, right. So yeah, purpose built software actually useful, even if it's bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, I I think there's so many. You said you kind of quoted me for what I was going to say, which is why isn't this software? I mean, if you consider that by the time the second edition of this book came out, Emacs was four years old. You know, the uh, like there could have been free and open source software that mapped to the corporation but was hackable the way Emacs is hackable that could have built all of this. I mean, someone could have done this at the time of the second edition of this book, but they didn't. And when I went to Metaforum in 2019, that was one of my big questions for Peter Tudnam and Elena Leonard and Raul Espejo was, where is the software? Was it written? What happened to it? And a big part of it was the software that was written was proprietary and it was written for obsolete machines and no one had the rights to the source code. And it very, very quickly became horribly obsolete and useless. And to me, I cry thinking about this because they didn't have a concept of free software. And because they didn't have a concept of free software, it was just obvious that software was proprietary. And because software was proprietary, it ended up in these buckets and the buckets deteriorated and it became worthless. And it's such an incredible lost opportunity that yeah. would have completely transformed the world of work. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I can definitely imagine the like visual basic uh, implementation of the VSM uh, that was written somewhere. Uh, but even like stuff that was like proprietary to like OS two or like like is, is <laughs> you know is limited to like OS two warp and it won't run on Windows. Uh, and we're <laughs> like you know uh, it, the these implementations are totally imaginable and, and completely useless. Especially when you consider that portability becomes all the more important when you consider the application of this software, yeah. right? Because, like, there are, uh, you know, proprietary uh, sort of, like, organizational solutions or whatever uh, that are written in, like, COBOL and are, are, are just maintained and are, like, it's like if this archaic system fails, the whole thing is fucked, and these exist in, like, the deep, dark depths of, uh, of organizations everywhere, but they work because they're purpose-built for that organization. By its very nature, VSM software has to be something that is portable, and therefore it really needs to be uh, uh, free software. Um, yeah, obviously. And it's, with the, the thing that's so exasperating about this is here we are in the year 2020. This book, even the second edition, is 40 years old. And where is the VSM software? Like, I mean, where is Stafford Beer in nerd culture? Like, you figure that these hackers who are building <laughs> Linux had no idea that Stafford Beer existed when they very well could have. I mean, Stafford Beer is a contemporary of Richard Stallman and Bill Joy, you know? Like, why wasn't this just becoming part of hacker culture? And I, the only thing I can think of is you get these fucking meatheads like Eric Raymond pushing everyone towards techno-libertarian shite. And having everyone think of themselves as anarcho-capitalists. It's just puerile. Like, I mean, we could be building this software today, but we've lost 40-year head start on this. You know, I mean, we should be building the software today. I mean, this software should be as easy as writing apt get VSM on any Linux, any Debian based machine, you know, or yum, if you're doing Red Hat, like it should just be obviously part of the ecosystem. 
Even yeah, Windows is getting logic. a pot package manager now, so, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and especially customizable the way Emacs is customizable so people can do things with it that are completely unfathomable to the original creators. Well, I mean, we have the uh, uh, resources uh, within uh, this group here uh, to make the software... So I think it would probably be good to actually set up a working group for the purposes of making this software. Uh, oh, absolutely. Be yeah, because, like, you know, it's... Um, uh, where is it in nerd culture? It's here, right? <laughs> That's where it is. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, like, we should definitely set that up. Um, yeah. maybe in a platform that's, or maybe in like, a a, a place that is, that is not, uh, paid to get into, but, uh, it might start here. Um, anyway, uh, well, let's move on, but th that's definitely something we need to take away from this. We need to make this software. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a significant action point. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, what is true of the small business is a fortiori, uh, true of the large business a really big firm is an amalgam of smaller firms. There are divisions, subsidiaries, and so forth. If the human brain is beaten in the attempt to control a firm, which is as least ostensibly one, then how much more difficult is it for the holding company of a large corporation to operate sensibly? Yet here again, we are dealing with something intended to be a single viable organism. Just as there were competing claims and competing views of the world in the smaller firm because of the fragmentation into production sales and so forth, so there are competing views between whole companies when they are formed into a giant corporation. Uh, I think especially here of Sony. Sony is an excellent example of this, right? Uh, for the longest time, uh, you know, Sony had the sort of group ethos of we build quality hardware, uh, we are an engineer's company, um, and we make consumer electronics, and that was all shared. But you had, like, a, a, an enormous proliferation of production groups within Sony, so they would just go on making, like, you know, we're going to build the best uh, FM alarm clock, even though people are mostly interested in iPods now. Uh, like, you know, it, it, like it, there was no cohesion. It was just... A, an enormous product line that this 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 uh, group was coming up with because they all had their little fiefdoms that wanted to go on producing stuff. Um, unhappily, the directors at, let us call it group level, are still constrained by the three pound computers in their skulls, just as is the head of the small business or the one man band himself. I often think that if a scientist were, arrived, were to arrive from Mars and study our organization charts, well, now that we know that aliens exist, maybe maybe somebody has. Maybe an, maybe an alien has done this. Uh, he uh, would inevitably conclude that the managing director of the corporation must have a brain weighing half a ton. Uh, that is to say, we organize ourselves in a way which the law of requisite variety and information theory in general cannot justify, unless the size of people's heads in increases exponentially with their seniority. Unhappily, this is never true, except perhaps in a metaphorical sense. Um, so, you know, uh, <laughs> very true. Uh, so the question, what is the model a model of, is answered by a viable organism, regardless of its size. This is an interesting invariant of the model's application, but it does, as I warned, lead to confusion unless we are careful. The warning is this. Before anyone starts thinking about a business in terms of this model, he must first dis clearly decide how the model is supposed to fit. If he looks at the actual organization, he finds some parts of it to be conscious, some parts autonomic, and so on. The point is that which parts are which varies depending on the application he tries to make. If we consider a giant corporation as a viable entity, then the main board alone can possibly be allocated a conscious role. 
The boards of subsidiary companies are, from the standpoint of the holding board, centers of autonomic activity. But this does not prevent our moving into one of the subsidiary companies and treating that as a viable entity. If we do, it will mean that our control system is aimed at obtaining survival-worthy policies for that company as if it were isolated. In that case, it may go to war with its associate companies, and then the main board will have to sort the matter out. Um, so we do see that these are uh, separate cases. Um, doing a VSM for a, a, a corporate group is not going to yield the VSM for the subsidiaries, right? It's only going to give you viability at the group level, not at the subsidiary level. Um, so that means you really need thoroughgoing application and you really need a VSM of VSMs, right? Like you need integration uh, for this to work. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, and, and you need to really clarify which level you're looking at at any given time. Because I think it, 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 would be too, it would be too easy to try to account for everything at once and end up with a kind of rhizomatic sprawl of just of mess and say, well, I don't know where the fuck this to do is. But like, if you, if you focus on which layer of recursion you actually care about, you can forget about all the details below, you can forget about the details above, and you focus on that layer. And then later, you can step up or down. But you have to be, like, what's the system in focus? Very, very important question. Yeah, it's just Ashley's, Ashby's law, right? Uh in terms of doing this stuff. Um, okay, Mark, go ahead. Uh, you're, you're muted, Mark. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, just a minor note, but uh, yeah, I just, when I'm reading these chapters, like uh, I really think of the kind of the historical context, uh, like some of these chapters focus more on like the conglomerate era of like, you know, you have these things you ha where the groups are like not even in the same business area necessarily right you know so it's like the where the resource like some of it in the earlier chapters it goes from like well you had the kind of the sole proprietor thing and then maybe they had another factory that was across town or you know 100 miles away or whatever but then at this point it's just like dealing with things that like maybe they aren't viable because they're <laughs> just too damn big anyways but uh um anyways yeah just uh um just to point at that because it just it, these little things just kind of pop up and then you think like well is that still i mean obviously there's still big big companies trying to you know uh you know dominate in multiple fields at the same time but it's just kind of a, a different thing than like you know the whole amazon apple google world we're in now right and well um what this brings to mind for me is like what if you did a vsm for bain capital Right. Uh, yeah, totally. Like a viable version of Bain Capital is going to kill other organizations. <laughs> exactly. Right. Because it is inherently a predatory organize organism. Um, like you can have a viable predator. Right. That, that is just going to go around and effectively eat other organizations um, for its own enrichment and survival. Uh, so, yeah, that like that does clarify something. Right. Because. If you look at it at that group level, the uh, the individual organizations that Bain Capital consumes um, are not really integral to the viability of Bain Capital. Um, their death is immaterial to it. Uh, in fact, it's functional. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, that's really really important stuff, right? Because like. Um the but perhaps by, by way of analogy there, there there is a certain kind of sea slug in the world um which is one of its defense strategies is actually a really remarkable offensive strategy is it, it it eats a another some some other bullshit fucking lobster or whatever but this other organism has these um like cells it has these like micro organ or, organs that have like poison stingers in them and if if you trigger the cell it like goes and fires these little tendrils and it's very painful the sea slug eats this guy and while digesting him, absorbs those like hand grenades essentially, absorbs them without triggering them. Then it moves the little hand grenades out to the surface of its own skin and it appropriates the defense of the other organism. 
So if you think of those cells as VSM, the viable systems, which they are, those are the, the, the integrity of the prey is broken down and its component parts are taken out and repurposed for the predator to use. So it is, it is very possible to split these things apart and re reorganize them. So I mean, like even beer suggests that like the, uh, I don't know, the plastics manufacturing department of a firm could be split off as a, as a, as a different organism or could even be sold to another company. And it just, you just go and plunk it down somewhere else. So th there is a plasticity to all this that, uh, like these, these sub bodies can leave the body and go somewhere else as well. And they can be repurposed, in fact. And precisely because they're modular, like they are, they are self-contained. Like if that little hand grenade cell was not self-contained, the, the sea slug would find it impossible to get at its resources. It's the fact that it is contained. It can like develop an evolutionary strategy to grab it without, without triggering it and then like move it to the surface of its own skin. So it, it like grows a completely new, it grows a completely new function by appropriating it from a different organism rather than developing it internally. Remarkable stuff. Really remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, uh, there is an important passage here uh, where Beer sort of addresses this question of like, well, like, is viability at the maximum level of, of, of uh, the system actually just going to be predatory? Um, so he says, uh, from this point of view of the man, or from the point of view of the management scientist at any rate, he will apply his model where he's paid to work and apply it. Uh, to drop yet another stage, for instance, it is quite common for the OR man to be pegged at a departmental level within a company, within a larger company, within a corporation. There is then nothing to stop the OR man from using an organic control module within the department if it seems worth the effort. Uh, but the onus is on senior management to have these things rightly applied. I have seen it happen that one department was made so effective that gross imbalance within the company was created and that one department was virtually controlling the firm. From our point of view, at any rate, we can do no more than acknowledge that the model ought to be applied to the major entity with which we have to deal. If the prime minister is reading this, she will realize that the model should be applied to the country. British prime ministers, however, as each memoir in turn shows, prefer reading that which rehearses the past rather than reading directed to the future over which supposedly they have some influence. Uh, this is not the case with some other countries as part four shows. So, uh, you know, um, he's, he's calling Thatcher out for essentially being a neoliberal, uh, right? For just reiterating liberalism. Um, but, uh, also importantly, like, you know, he's sort of saying, like, hey, some countries actually do this, like Chile, and we should learn from that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it kind of implies that, like, this country-level VSM ought to have some concern for its component systems, right? It shouldn't just... Uh, you know, devour them, <laughs> right? Like it, it shouldn't be like, uh, you know, a country in World War One just producing a meat grinder uh, of its own citizenry um, in order to survive. Uh, that does seem to be something that is a little bit ambiguous uh, in what Beer is stating. Um, but if, if you think about the long-term viability of the system – it really should, you know, focus on renewable resources in a sense, right? Um, uh, Matt, go ahead. Uh, Matt, you're muted. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking back the, the, the back to uh, what we were talking about earlier of like where um, system one ends and like the the, the actual subsystems uh, begin. You know, um, uh, maybe uh, like um, you know. Like what, um, what capitalism kind of considers, um, subject versus object or like, or like the four sheeps from, uh, um, uh, from more or something. Well, or, you know, what, yeah, like, like what, what is like a substrate that, you know, you're allowed to just consume and, and reshape for your purposes versus like, what do you consider part of you in some way is an interesting, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that is like, Maybe a question that gets beyond viability and is actually an ethical question, um, right? Uh, Matt, go ahead. 
I mean, and, and also, yeah, just, just like on a functional level, level like, like, like you can kind of tell like what the system like kind of considers like, you know, uh, uh, like feedstock versus like its body. And also like, I, I think uh, you can kind of see like the difference in orientation between like, uh, uh, you know, like, like, like fascists who think in terms of like of an actual like a body politic. Well, th that's part of why that's wrong, because, you know, like in World War One kind of shows you no, the, 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 the body politic does not actually consider you part of its body. Like, it will very happily, like, use you as a resource to do its real objectives. Because, you know, the real actor is capital. Like, there is no Germany. Like, yeah, well, and, and like, it, yeah, like, you can um, look, for example, I'm, I'm just thinking about having read the book Stalingrad, right? Um, and that describes in detail uh, the sort of horrific death of the... Uh, I believe it was the German Fifth Army. I mean, the, the horrific deaths on the Soviet side were, uh, you know, very real. And people were absolutely used as just like cannon fodder. Um, was, like the Soviet tactics were incredibly wasteful of human life. Uh, but the the German approach was, you know, in its sort of like micro level, maybe more considerate of the lives of its soldiers, but like <laughs> when it came down to it, Hitler's word was final and the generals were never going to stand up to him because of their individual political interests and also their complicity with Hitler. Like Hitler, Hitler by making everyone complicit with him made it so that his will really did override any concerns of viability for the entire country. Um, it's this incredible parasitism. Um, so, you know, you just had soldiers in the Fifth Army who pretty much to the end, freezing to death without food, surrounded on all sides by the Soviet Army, they refused to attempt an operation to break out of the, 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 the trap that they were in because so many of them honestly believe had either like engaged in learned helplessness or had, um, they honestly believed that, that Hitler would not let them die. Um, and, and, and when the Soviets offered them surrender, they said, we cannot, sir, we cannot take surrender on ideological grounds because we believe in the Fuhrer. Like, uh, you know that is incredibly toxic stuff um uh, when you you think about a uh organism devouring its component parts um so yeah this this uh fascism is so terrible um <laughs> but uh yeah okay let's let's move on from fascism and from thatcher uh to other other things uh, so the next part of this 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 chapter is really going to make the linkage between uh, the the uh, anatomy and physiology we've been discussing with the organizational theory. Um, uh, I think I kind of want to just ask for general thoughts here because I don't want to get too bogged down in the details. I think the only really important detail to focus on is that system one connection that we uh, were discussing earlier. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that's the, that's the thing, right? That like by the time you, um, by the time you get to figure 22 on page 130, you can see the whole thing. And yeah, that, that, that like, it's really clearly labeled, right? That like you have the, the vertical column of A, B, C, D, which actual subsidiaries, the actual bodies, the, the, the actual organs. And then system one, which is 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D on the right-hand side, are the control interfaces of those sub-organs. So I, I, I think, I, I again, reiterate that I, I think this, can, this, this model is not so much about, like, enclosure as it is kind of, like, spindly sort of spider web interconnection. That it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not concerned with subsuming the entirety of the organ. It's subsuming the control function of the organ, or, like, you know, interfacing with it. Um, and that that is less clear if you just think of system one as being solely about the 
the, the, or, the if system one is the organ. I think we actually saw it in the previous in one of the previous chapters with the control of the respiratory system, where the lungs are an organ, but the respiratory control structure is a distributed control mechanism that is not identical to the lung, which is tricky because we we often think respiratory system equals lung. And I think what Beer is getting at here is they're actually quite distinct things. There's the organ and then there's the control of the organ. And it's the control of the organ that's integrated, not. It's a fo- right. It's a focus on control and it's a focus on, um, uh, you know, to get to that cybernetics idea, it's a focus on steers personship, right? Um, steering is, is what we're interested here in. So it's not that, you know, these organs could just do whatever the hell they want. They are being. Um, what does Marx call it? Uh, it, it's not real subsumption, but it's the, the first stage of subsumption that Marx describes. Formal Formal subsumption. subsumption. Yeah. I think, I think, I think what Beer is describing here is a form of formal subsumption, which because of the nature of feedback that he is describing in the earlier parts of the book ultimately becomes real subsumption. Right, because f- feedback is dominant over the signal that's mm-hmm. coming in. Um, yeah. So, like, it's real tricky. Like, it's not. I guess there's a distinction between real subsumption and total subsumption, right? Okay. Because it's not total subsumption, but it is providing that feedback that is actually directing the organs uh, in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it ultimately. Um, I guess we can draw a distinction. That I kind of don't want to dwell on it too long, but I guess we can draw a distinction like the subsumption levels between like um, the kind of way that a person is subsumed into, say, a company, uh, where it's, it's this like contractual relational sort of thing. Where yeah, I go to work every day, but I can kind of choose not to. I can go somewhere else, right? But like it's 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 an association rather than a full containment. Like my entire con- my entire being is not contained within the company. Whereas by contrast, to go back to the, the fascists, right? Like. If you were a Wehrmacht soldier in, in Germany, your entire your entire fucking body was subsumed by the the German people or the, the the sort of whatever that containing object was. It was supposed to devour and contain the entirety of your being, and that's that's a very different kind of like absolute subsumption versus the kind of uh, control integration that we're talking about here. Uh, where there is there is still something exterior, there is still something excessive left over for the subsidiary to enjoy on its own, but there is there is a feedback control integration. Uh, and I think it's just it's important to point those out that we're not we're not talking about like the kind of body politic of fascism with like its absolute and, and complete metaphysical containment of everything inside of us. It. It's a it's a it's a control structure. Yeah, um, you know this this definitely brings up the idea of totalitarianism. Right, the totalitarianism involves a kind of subsumption, even if only ideally, um, that is uh, distinct from the kind of subsumption that Beer is talking about here of the VSM. Uh, Because, yeah, like, yes, it is an associational thing. At the same time, you're going to develop a habitus based on your role in the organization, right? Like, (laughs) you will become a company person. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, that is a real thing, but it's not a perfect binding and it's not a perfect subsumption. It's like a, it's a conditioning of growth and, and, and a steering of the, of the, of the, the unit, um, that happens. Um, just as, you know, we all become, uh, capitalist actors in this hell world we live in. Um, all right. Uh, so I, I agree. That's like the most important thing. Um, there is a talk about time in here, which is really just a reiteration of what we talked about in the previous chapter that like the horizontal connections are more rapid, right? Than the, up the vertical connections. Um, and the vertical, like if, if, that's just an Ashby's law thing, like where he says, like, you can't possibly have, what is it? Um, there must be an in- immediate recognition of the actual state of affairs. Otherwise, time lags are introduced, which the model from control engineering reveals will send the reflex loop into uncontrolled oscillation. Uh, there must finally be a way of commanding 
the subsidiary to update its plan to meet whatever difficulties are encountered. It is surely true that the emergency action which the local management is compelled to take in its subsidiary under an orthodox company control system is usually not the best that could be taken from the overall corporate point of view. There is simply no reason why it should be, because the local management has only the local facts to go on. In an extreme case, it may of course start telephoning, but here again it will run into the constraints of the law of requisite variety. Men simply cannot telephone all the other men in the company who may be quite seriously affected by an emergency decision every time there is a slight departure from plan. So this is getting to um, what we see in Project Cybersyn, where Beer is like really works with his team on developing UI that is going to provide the relevant information in the most rapid time possible. Um, and it's not going to provide, it's going to minimize noise as much as possible um, so that you can get kind of an optimal speed of operation, um, which is not sort of like, you know, everything operating at the same speed as horizontal connections would operate, but it's trying to limit that delta as much as you possibly can. Um, uh, another important point here is the, if we look at figure 22, um, there are these, uh, dots and lines that run at the right hand and left hand side of the diagram. Uh, and this is, uh, supposed to be, it's on the previous page he describes it, so it's a little confusing. Um, so he says, uh, the autonomic system sympathetic in the right of the diagram is moderating, uh, monitoring all of this. It uses a higher order language than system two because it has to uh, discuss system two's behavior. If its job is to stabilize the production environment of the firm, it must apply feedbacks at the various levels which will tend to damp down the oscillations caused by the replanning adjustments. Even so, what is now going on is a frenetic activity, and one would see this again in the case where the higher order, or where the higher control centers in the firm called for a major productive effort in order to meet some kind of crisis. If that happens, all the subsidiaries will know about it. Look at the diagram. Their system one responses will go straight into the system two computers where they will be locally rationalized and will be passed on to the control centers of system three through the central somatic system. But the same information will also rise up the sympathetic trunk and will reach the control center by another route. The stimulatory feedbacks work here so that there is a right hand loop of excitatory activity going on, which is trying to meet the call of the leadership. Uh, but suppose this leads, all this leads to too much strain in the subsidiaries. There are many ways of monitoring what is happening there to protect the firm from risk. Uh, productivity, productivity indices measuring the rate of production may rise above the upper control limits normally in force. The level of overtime work may rise, uh, may rise dangerously too. Inspection procedures may become unstable because everyone is in too much of a hurry. Such signs of undue pressure will be registered in the autonomic or parasympathetic network shown on the left of the diagram. These data too will be fed up to the control centers of system three. The result must be to damp down activity in the cause of safety so that an inhibitory loop is going on around the left hand side of the diagram. It is then up to autonomic system as a whole to balance the excitatory and inhibitory pictures to produce an overall internal stability and is certainly up to system three to report upwards through system four to five where the policy was formulated. Um, so, uh, you know, Jeremy brought this up in the previous uh, chapter, but uh, this is where we see it in the organization. Uh, Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, in the heart of enterprise and then later on in diagnosing the system, these are sort of later passes at this. And I think they're, I think he debugs some of the stuff in Brain of the Firm in the later books. So, for example, if you look at the diagram uh, 22, the 
towards the left, but not quite fully on the left, while it's still part of it, the arm that goes down, which he's calling the parasympathetic part, in the later works of Beer, he calls that whole trunk uh, system three star, three asterisk, because he feels that by the time it leaves the control box and enters back into these subsidiaries, it's no longer inside the control room of System 3, but it's ventured back into the outer parts of the system. So he calls that chunk Three Star. One of the things that we might do in the future, I don't know, but, uh, you know, um, Heart of Enterprise is kind of a chore because there's it's it's a very, very weird book. But there's a lot of stuff in there that's super valuable. And one part of it is he comes up with laws, axioms, postulates, and theories. Now, that's going to be horrifically obtuse to a modern reader. But a lot of it is about how load balancing works in the VSM. And I think that stuff is very, very valuable. Um, And I don't fully understand it. So (laughs) it would be really nice at some future period to get a group of people like ourselves to tackle these axioms and see if they make sense. Well, yeah, I mean, hopefully we can maybe get, like, Ezri involved in that, given that she has a background in uh, analytic logic uh, and would be good at at parsing axioms and so on. Um, (laughs) uh, Because I I sure don't. Um, All right. uh, Cool. So that yeah, that's really good to know that, that that parasympathetic system actually is what later evolves into System Three Star. Um, uh, okay, um, so I'll just read the last two paragraphs here, and then we'll wrap. Uh, the major control task in the firm, as far as its existing activity, which we began by calling Technology A, is concerned, is to bring these two into accord. Sometimes production will have to make a concession. If costs go up uh, through using a somewhat inefficient production route in order to meet a delivery promise. Sometimes sales must make a concession. It has to take a longer delivery promise on some items in order that the cost of overtime should not exceed all bounds. If full-scale scientific method is applied in the firm, we shall find that System 3 is the center of a major resource allocation procedure. Linear programming techniques, or better still, dynamic programming techniques, belong at this level and operate to this end. Well, that is what control systems are for. The quintuple hierarchic system envisioned here is supposed to do it as efficiently as possible. So far, we have discussed from a senior, that is a corporate management standpoint, the three lowest levels of the five. They constitute autonomic management a name chosen from the neurophysiology rather than business lore to designate what must happen within the firm to ensure its internal stability without much top-down intervention. It has been tried in the body and it works. So the proof is in the pudding. The body works. Uh, Managers, this is aimed at you. uh, And why don't you put it into effect Um, is kind of the the punchy end to this chapter. Um, So... uh, Chapter 10 uh, is our next one. Uh, That is the biggest switch. Uh, So this is not the rumored uh, Nintendo Switch Ultra Pro. Uh, This is, is in fact, another switch. Uh, (laughs) And yeah, uh, we will talk about that next week. Uh, So thank you, everyone, uh, for your time. Uh, I'll have the recording up sometime tonight. Um, and uh, I'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. 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 Uh, Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.